Welcome to Tell Us Something. Dave Bolter is a New England boy who moved to Montana early in the spring of 1993. He graduated from the University of Montana with a degree in forestry specializing in recreation management. He has been making his living as a stonemason for approximately 20 years and is a veteran athlete and coach in mixed martial arts. Please welcome Dave Bolter. Good evening. <laughs> so my story begins back in New England. I was a um, young boy, about two years old. One of my first memories of life uh, up to that point was going down the mountain in between my dad's legs skiing. And I remember him asking me, Dave, are you having fun? Would you like to go faster? And I remember looking up, yeah, you know, and that, that was it. Skiing was my life sports. So um, I kept on doing all that, experimented with a variety of other sports, soccer, lacrosse, cycling, all that. Um, tried every one of them out for approximately six months before I either loved them or I hated them. That's when I first found out that gnomes can't play basketball. <laughs> so I carried my little book of sports, soccer, lacrosse, ski racing into high school. Um, the ice of the East Coast left me with two knee surgeries before I graduated high school. Came out west, Colorado, did a couple of years there before I moved up to Montana. Um, uh, yeah, that's what I said too. I was like, what am I doing in Colorado? Get me to Montana. And so I transferred up here, was a geology major, switched to rec management. Um, where I started working with the adaptive ski program at uh, the long lost Marshall Mountain. Um, bums me out, but I also, that gave me a great opportunity. I was like, wow, this is some really cool people to work with. Adaptive skiing, helping people out. I get to ski, win. So I started getting close to graduation time. East Coast was calling again. I found out there's a really good uh, internship program back there in a mountain uh, at Atash Bear Peak. It was right down the road from where my grandparents live. My parents are there, all my friends. I was like, okay. So drove back there. Three weeks into that internship, I was free skiing um, with a paraplegic and an amputee when I had a freak accident, destroyed my knee, had five hours of uh, emergency reconstructive surgery two days later. Two weeks after that, those same two guys that I was skiing with had me skiing in a monoski as if I was a paraplegic. My, my boss at the time was like, I'm not paying attention to this. And she <laughs> avoided eye contact with me while I was, had my knee in the brace and icing it in between runs, you know, with my little cryo pack. And, but I learned how to ski in a monoski whole new experience. It's fantastic. So, um, but I was really missing Montana. Um, that injury caused a lot of setbacks with me. I started getting depressed. I wanted to move back to Montana. I couldn't play sports. You know, skiing I could sort of do, but I was very limited. No soccer, none of that. So, I don't know. I was missing Montana. Started eating too much and drinking beers and soda and I don't know, I found out that I really like to eat crappy food. Um, but I started packing it on and I was bummed out, but I made up my mind, I have to get back to Montana. So I hustled back to Montana 2001, um, like right after the world trade went down. Uh, I said, I really need to get out of the East Coast and screw this place. So I came back to Montana. Um, and right, I was here for about a year, and one of my good friends, I was struggling looking for a sport, soccer, nah, but my buddy um, suggested that I get into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, uh, and I said, what is that, you know, and we'd, the ultimate fighting and UFC and pride fighting championships out of Japan started coming in to, 
I don't know, popularity at that time, the early 2000s, and we would all get together and watch, you know, these athletes wail on each other, and that's kind of how I looked at it. I didn't really see the art of it. Um, but I agreed. I was like, all right, I'll try it, you know. So I got my gi, and I went to Socorro down the road here on Higgins, and I, uh, yeah, I found out quickly how amazing that sport is. You can really cause a huge amount of damage to somebody, but as soon as they tap, you're not injured anymore. Like, you, you, you can keep going, you know. So I found that out, but, you know, through rolling, I injured myself, whatever. <laughs> Kept training uh, a little bit off and on, uh, still looking for a new sport. Wasn't really thinking that that was my path, so other friends suggested kayaking. I'm like, all right, I'll try kayaking. Yeah, bro, you're built for it, dude. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I did the Frenchtown Pond, got my roll, did my roll in the Blackfoot. Everything was great. Okay, Dave, you're totally ready for the gorge. And I'm like, uh, okay. And I jumped in the gorge with my friends, and I forget which wave it was that blew me over, but I remembered how to roll. I got down, I went to snap my hips, I got my head up right at the last second, and I got blown over by another wave. I did it again, and my shoulder popped out. I was back underwater, battling. Couldn't roll anymore. Wet exit with a blown shoulder, boat filled with water, kick to shore, paddle, everything. All my friends were like, oh, you made it good. You know, I was like, man, fuck kayaking. You guys are crazy. <laughs> I don't know how the hell, all the respect, kayakers, that's real. I was like, fuck this, I'm not getting back in that water. So I threw that kayak over my shoulder and battled up the scree pile to the road and I started walking back to Missoula so on the highway. And <laughs> truck driver thankfully stopped and picked me up. I was very thankful and made it home, returned all that gear, and sold everything else that I had bought, thinking that I would love that sport. And anyway, the struggle for new sports continued, and we kept watching all these UFC fights and everything, and I'm like, damn, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? Started getting fat again, addicted to soda. I'm like, oh Christ, this cannot keep going on. So one day I said, that's it quit drinking soda, I'm gonna pick up fighting. And, uh, and I, once I quit drinking soda, I lost 15 pounds the first week, started training, <laughs> started training, feeling great. I told my coach, I'm like, dude, get me a fight. He looked at me like I was crazy, but he said, all right, let's do it. So six months later, I stepped in uh, to the ring out at Rock Creek Lodge, uh, July 7th. 2007, it was about 103 degrees. I was the second fight of the night, nerves galore. I had no idea what the hell to expect. I'd never really been in a fight before in my life. I was like, wow, well, <laughs> training's one thing, but an actual fight, holy shit, you know, there's a thousand people screaming, wanting to see blood, and I'm like, wow. All right, let's do this, you know? And my, First fight ends, my buddy comes out, he's all busted up, but he won. He was like, oh, dude, that was awesome, you know? And I'm like, holy shit, all right, let's go. <laughs> Walking out to the ring, it's so hot, 103 degrees. I'm like, what in the hell? Christ, scared. Climb into the ring, walking around, the mat is black, 130 degrees. I'm like, wow, I'm nervous, but I burn my feet if I sit still, you know? So I fight finally, the bell rings, boom, we start to touch gloves, and this kid from Butte lit me up. He basically, <laughs> he basically gassed out beating me up. Uh, I'm not going to lie. But none of the injuries, none of his hits really got me worse than my knee explosions or all the other things that have happened in my life, and I'm like, well, hell, the ref's there to stop it if it gets too crazy, so let's keep going. And, uh, you know, the, the, made it through the first round, second round. I'm sitting there. I don't even hear a word my coach is saying to me in between rounds. I'm just like, holy shit, when is this over, you know? And <laughs> about 
he's still giving me a beating. I'm starting to throw a beating back to him. You know, I'm feeling pretty good. And then finally, I just, I'm like, I can't take this anymore. This kid, he's not going to get me down, and I can't knock him down. I finally lost it. Grabbed him, threw him down on the ground, and I finished him off just like Ralphie in uh, The Christmas Story. <laughs> beating up that beating up that bully, felt great, you know, ref stops the fight, peels me off, I get my hand raised, I still don't know what the hell happened, adrenaline and everything, overheated, I get, craw I get brought into the ambulance, I'm sitting there with ice packed under my armpits, my groin, throwing up in the bar pail there, and the EMTs are looking at me, blood leaking out everywhere, and my buddy comes in with a couple of beers, and I drink one down, and I'm like, man, I can do better than that. <laughs> and uh, that was the start of my 13-year-long mixed martial arts career. Thanks, Dave. I feel like this is like a recurring thing that happens with me. I keep losing my note card. Every event, it happens. So I'm going to use my phone. Ainsley McGuaw is a writer and essayist, essayist whose work appears in the current issue of Barrel House Journal and has previously been published in Grist, Tahoma Literary Review, Salon, and the Washington Post, among others. She was recently appointed as the chair of the Parks and Rec Committee in the town where she lives. She has never seen the sitcom. Please welcome Ainsley McWaugh. When I was 16 years old, I lived in the sleepy suburbs of Ottawa, Canada's capital. I was a straight A student. I bench warmed for the basketball team. I'd never been on a date. I happily wore the same baggy jeans and gray zip up hoodie to school every day. And the only fashion magazines I ever flipped through were the 17s that came to my house every month addressed to my older sister. So it came as a huge surprise to everyone, but mostly me, that after a series of events I won't go into now, I was scouted, discovered by one of Manhattan's top modeling agencies. The weekend before my 17th birthday, I was flown to Paris to walk in my first fashion show. Backstage, before the show, Christian Dior, spring summer 95, that was held in the Carousel de Louvre, I sat next to models that even I had heard of, Linda Evangelista, Helena Christensen, Tyra Banks. The champagne flowed, the camera flashes popped, the show itself was a blur, but Paris was so beautiful. <laughs> That's what I told my friends and family when I got home. And this is what I didn't tell them. That at the fitting, the day before the show, when it was my turn to get my outfit approved, the designer, an older Italian man, stepped towards me. And without saying a word, he ripped off my shirt. Next, with his bare hands, he tried to readjust my breasts into something that would better fit his creation, as if I were merely a block of clay. And when it was clear this wasn't gonna happen, he just turned and walked away from me, leaving me standing there half naked in a room full of strangers. I rushed to find my own clothes that I had left folded in a neat pile in the corner somewhere, and I was stopped multiple times by other models who said things like, oh my god, the designer noticed you, and oh my god, you are so lucky. And as I fought to hold back the tears welling in my eyes, I was confused, because not only was the designer's behavior acceptable, it was enviable. And I don't know how I knew it, but I did know in that moment that if I wanted to succeed in this business, I'd need to learn how to keep my mouth shut. 
And of course I wanted to succeed. I was 16 years old and I'd just been invited into this elite industry. I was wooed by its promise of travel and money and fame, of escape. One month after I graduated high school, when I was 17 years old, I moved to New York City, unknowingly about to embark on a career that sells sex before I'd even had sex. For the next three years, I jumped from market to market, Milan, Paris, London, Hamburg, New York. And at first I loved it. I shot for countless magazines. I wore high fashion clothes on the runway. There were VIP parties complete with celebrity interactions. There were free dinners, free drinks. And yet when I was 20, I couldn't keep up with the pressures inherent in the industry anymore, like the imposed thinness and the constant relocation. Before the internet, living abroad was an extremely isolating experience, which only compounded my feelings of depression. And again, I was confused because here I was surrounded by all these things you're supposed to want to have. Here I was surrounded by people constantly telling me how lucky I was. And yet I didn't feel that way. Fortunately, my parents insisted I go back to school, which I did and I got a degree in psychology. But the spring before I graduated, I was scouted to model again. And I figured that modeling could be a great way to make some money in the short term. I mean, I possessed the skill set. And I figured that I was strong enough to handle anything the industry threw at me this time around. I was sucked back in. In the fall of 2012, I was 35 years old, living in New York, and my job still was model. And though the nature of the bookings had changed over the course of my career, from magazine covers and campaigns, to what those in the industry referred to as the closet. I spent days sitting in a windowless room, sometimes as small as four by 10 feet, sometimes bigger, sometimes alone, and sometimes with other models, and I'd wait until somebody brought me an outfit or 100 to try on and model for the buyers from upscale department stores and boutiques in the adjacent showroom. Now there are many times over the course of my career when I probably should have considered quitting, like that first fashion show, for example. Or when I was 19 and an agent invited me into his office and told me to not eat anything for the next two days and over the next two weeks mm, to really watch what I ate but drink a lot of water. Or when I was 25 and my agent suggested that I never tell anyone I had a university degree because it might make people feel bad about themselves. Or when I was 31, or when I was 31 and a designer spit in my face on set at a photo shoot because he decided he didn't like me. And while all of those instances and others made me feel less than worthless, more than worthless, um, I never said anything because I had learned from the start that to speak up meant to be difficult and to be difficult meant to be overlooked for jobs, jobs that sometimes came with a huge paycheck. And that's the thing about modeling. The money isn't always there, but the promise of money is which is how I lasted in the business as long as I did. That and as time passed, I came to believe I wasn't capable of doing anything else. On a Monday afternoon in November 2012, as I stood out in the showroom modeling my next outfit, one of the buyers looked me in the eye, an older man, and he said, that shirt makes your belly look big. That wasn't a big deal. I was so used to comments like that, comments dissecting my appearance and telling me what was wrong with me to my face. I was numb to comments like that. What made this time so special was that he said it to me as I stood next to a model who had just announced in the closet that she was pregnant, five months along. She hadn't told the client yet, and I got this because she, like the rest of us, was hired for her exact measurements, and to deviate even a centimeter meant to possibly lose her job. So in cahoots with the dresser, the woman whose job it was to help us get dressed, uh, the pregnant model ensured that all of the baggier clothes went to her, leaving me with all the form-fitting ones. When I got home at the end of the day, my booker called. Ainsley, are you on your period? Yes, I said. I lied. Oh, good. I assured the client that must be the case, but they still ask that you don't come back to work this week. Now, it's important to note here that at this time, I was in my second year of grad school getting an MFA in creative writing. But I'm ashamed to say that up until three years earlier, I hadn't even known that an MFA in creative writing was a thing. 
I had been so sheltered by this industry. I had remained so amenable to it. But I had gravitated towards writing because I had amassed so many stories, and I wanted to learn the best way to tell them. But I still didn't know what I was going to do once my career ended. I mean, it's not like anyone in the industry cares to help you figure out what's next. You're valuable to them until you just aren't. So it was as if I existed every day living on a conveyor belt, a lineup of hungry women behind me, thinner, younger, prettier versions of myself ready to knock me off at any moment and into the oblivion of old age. When I hung up the phone with my booker, I started to cry, and I knew in that moment something needed to change. A year and a half later, my then boyfriend and I left New York City and moved to Southeast Idaho, of all places, and into the house, <laughs> and into the house that his great great grandparents built in 1914. I'd never lived, I'd never been to Idaho before. But I've lived in many places, and I reasoned you can build a life anywhere, which is exactly what we've done over the past five and a half years. And it hasn't always been easy. I've worked so many odd jobs. I was a community counselor for a while. I was a substitute high school teacher for three days. Um, I did. It wasn't for me. I, uh, I do copy editing for a home health care company. I even worked in a retail clothing store for a while. And with each of those jobs, I was lucky to get paid in two weeks what I used to earn in a day, sometimes even an hour as a model. And yeah, that was tough to take at first. But now, I can honestly say that even though I have far less, I have never felt luckier. That boyfriend became my husband. We look after each other, our home, and a dozen animals. I have a garden. I finally understand the value of a hard-earned dollar, and I finally understand that my worth as a human comes from more than being a desirable object. And it wasn't until I left the industry that I understood the extent of the psychological damage that had been inflicted. This industry that had socialized me, this industry that had treated me the same at 36 as it had at 16. And I was the ideal candidate, I'm ashamed to say. I was an eager, malleable teenager willing to do whatever it took in order to succeed, which is exactly what the industry is counting on. But I'm more ashamed that I didn't speak up when I saw these things that made me feel uncomfortable and the things that I knew were wrong. In January, I'm about to start a new job. I was recently hired by the College of Eastern Idaho to create and teach their first creative writing class for credit taught on campus. And I can't wait. I can't wait to help my students discover and develop their voices. But more than that, I can't wait to watch as they discover the transformative power that can come from finally using them. Thank you. Thank you, Ainsley. And thank you to everyone who is actively listening. People who interrupt, that's not okay. Think of it like this if you're conflicted. It's not consensual. John Haynes was born and raised in Plains, Montana. He lived in Kumato, Japan for 10 years. John currently works at Ace Hardware so he can volunteer at the Museum of Mountain Flying. 
please note, for the sake of clarity, the Miss Montana in the following story is stunningly beautiful. She's a 75-year-old airplane. Please welcome John Haynes. I am the volunteer coordinator out at the Museum of Mountain Flying. <laughs> but it hasn't always been that way. On January 3rd of this year was my first day volunteering at the museum. I opened up the door and I saw a 75-year-old DC-3, well, a nearly 75-year-old DC-3. It first came off the assembly line with the purpose of hauling people and cargo during World War II. It didn't see service beyond the American borders, but it would have a great life ahead of it. Um, Johnson Flying Service bought it as a surf, uh, surplus plane in 1946 and used it for smoke jumping and, and hauling cargo all over the region in, in uh, very rural areas. What I saw on that night was that we had a goal of getting it to fly by March, which was interesting because it had no engines <laughs> on it. <laughs> the, the interior was taken apart and waiting for modern amenities like good insulation and avionics to be installed. There was no operational avion or, uh, controls for the, the flight. It was basically a shell of the plane that it was about to become. Um, with that in mind, my first job there was to build shelves for the red shed in the museum. And I thought, well, that's not too sexy. <laughs> but when I came back later, a lot of the tools and paperwork that were strewn across the floor when I got there were in the shed and organized. And you soon realized that it doesn't matter what job you are doing, it is all important for the big picture. My second job that I can remember doing was getting onto one of those scissor lifts and going up into the nose of the plane <laughs> with it in mind to take some of the hoses out that were connected to the, the back of the dashboard that measured things like fuel and oil. And I was supposed to put the labels that were written on the hoses onto the ports that they were connected to, which became interesting fast because I saw two or three labels that said the exact same thing. Left engine, fuel, possibly oil. <laughs> well, February and March came and went, and we had a lot of progress, but the plane hadn't flown. In about sometime in April, our lead mechanic's parents showed up from Arizona, and they drove up in their RV, and were, they intended on staying for about two weeks. Uh, Bill is one of those people that's a good example of the type of volunteers we had out there. He's 70 plus years old and a dynamo. He could be everywhere at once and working on just about anything on the plane and feel very comfortable with it. And he would tell you a good story the whole time. Um, his wife, age and some health issues had caught up with her. So what would happen in the afternoon is she would need a break and go back to their RV and stay there a while. And when she wanted to come back, she'd honk the horn, and, and Bill would scurry off and wash all the oil products off his hands and bring her back out to, to help us out. Um, after a few rounds of the honk honk, one of our volunteers said, that's love. <laughs> a few days after that had happened, we'd hear honk honk and a chorus of, that's love. <laughs> April, again, a lot of progress, but it was not, or Miss Montana was not airborne yet. Um, but we were getting more and more confident as time went on. In the first week of May, now keep in mind, we we're having our send-off gala for a plane that hadn't flown on the weekend of Mother's Day, on the Saturday before Mother's Day. In the first week of May, we realized if we're gonna practice our, our jump for the Normandy, uh, ceremony. We needed a drop zone, in, uh, and I saw that as an opportunity to pitch 
Plains, Montana, my hometown. It's about an hour and a half drive, but a 20 minute flight, so it was perfect. Um, now, Al Charters, who is our jump master, and I drove up to Plains, and Al got about a 10 minute notice for this plan. So he showed up to the hangar and he said, Al, we're going up to Plains to find a drop zone. Mind you, Al isn't very tall in stature, but he can fill up a room with his self-confidence and sense of purpose. And I was a little intimidated by it, um, but I, I was willing to take the risk. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> so we drove up to Plains and we talked to the person who manages the airport up there. And we went out to visit the airport. And, and Al looks around and he says, it would work on a perfect day. <laughs> and I think we both knew that a perfect day is tough to plan for. So we drove back and talked to the manager of the airport who is in, in high gear for lobbying for this because he, he wanted an event like this to happen in little old Plains, Montana. And we said, well, maybe. And I had the idea of calling the people who own the Holland Ranch just west of town. The, so I called up Daisy Holland and I said, Daisy, have you heard about the Miss Montana project? And she said, well, yes, I have. I said, you know, we need a, a drop zone for our practice jump and we'd like to use your field just west of town. She said, well, sure. So basically, we had two 30-second conversations to get yes, so the support was there, and it was, it was a really neat thing. We ended up meeting with Daisy and the manager of the airport, and we, we got everything confirmed, but we did not know what day this would end up happening, so we said we have to keep this a secret. For any of you who have ever been to a small town, the best way to promote something <laughs> is to tell people to keep it a secret. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the first week in May. We had our send-off gala without the plane flying on a Saturday night, and we partied like it was going to happen, let me tell you. It was, it was a really fun event. That next Sunday was Mother's Day, and my mom is in the audience. I'd like to say thank you for allowing me to skip Mother's Day this year. <laughs> because Miss Montana flew, and I got the text at work, and I took off from work and I showed up to the airport and for once I was happy that Miss Montana hadn't flown yet. We, there was about 60 of us out there and a lot of us were the long-term uh, volunteers there that, that had put, some of us were working 40 hours a day and volunteering 30 or 40 hours on top of that and it was absolutely fun. I wouldn't trade it for anything. And the, that evening the plane took off and took its first flight in over 18 years. And it made it around the Valley of Missoula. We were so excited, it landed. And for a lot of us, there may not have been a dry eye. And you could blame it on the, on the springtime allergies, or uh, you know, maybe the cool breeze that was blowing, but I'd like to think it was all that perseverance, and patience, and hard work, and honk honk, that's love. <laughs> <laughs> That next day was a, a Monday, and they still needed to get some flight time. So they took a practice flight up to, through my hometown, the Valley of Plains, up to Kalispell and back to Missoula without too much incident, at least that they'll talk about. <laughs> and that night, I had driven up to Plains, and we made it official. We were going to do our practice jump in Plains. And I, it was like Christmas Eve. I was so excited. I could barely sleep. <laughs> so I had contacted a friend at the Plains School System, and they had let the entire school out to watch this happen. And they got onto the football field at 8.30, and guess what? We weren't going to show up on time. <laughs> <laughs> the plane had was going to fly east to west, so it flew over the entire town, right over the school, and it was also conveniently located, the flight path, right between the hospital and the cemetery. <laughs> Thankfully, we didn't need to use either one of those. <laughs> <laughs>
the, the plane was coming and, uh, and we were able to track it on flight tracker, but the folks at the school didn't know. And some of the kids and teachers were getting a little impatient. So they started to walk back into the school, especially the younger ones. And a friend of mine texted me, well, where's the plane? And I said, I gave it a few seconds because I knew it was probably between Quinn's Hot Springs and Paradise. And I said, listen. And as that plane came into the valley, you can hear those two 1,200 horsepower Pratt & Whitney's and it's a two for one deal. You feel it in both your heart and your soul. <laughs> and it came over town and did a loop and came back out and the first, for the jump. And the first people to come out of the plane were Kim Maynard and Amanda Holt. Kim happens to be one of the first female smoke jumpers ever. And it was... <laughs> Damn straight. <laughs> so she came out and, and landed and everything went off beautifully and we made a few more passes because there was several jumpers involved and by the end of it we all gathered together and the people were actually spread out and it took a while to get us together and a recently retired smoke jumper who lived in Plains had brought Vintage 1990 smoke jumper beer for this special occasion. <laughs> they say beer goes bad, but boy, it tasted good at 11 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> we were, the beer bottles were clanking, and we were absolutely ecstatic that all systems were a go for mechanically and with the jumpers. And we came to realize right there that we went from knowing that we could do this to actually proving it. And Miss Montana flew about 10 days later and left for Normandy. And believe it or not, it left Missoula with less than six or seven flight hours. And it made it to the East Coast without in incident, and it took the Blue Spruce route back to Europe. So it went Connecticut, Maine, up into Canada, at Newfoundland, and a few places in Greenland that I cannot pronounce. Reykjavik, Iceland, Scotland, and down to England where they were staging for the ceremonies for Normandy. When it was all said and done and they made it back to Montana, there was only one minor mechanical issue that was easily taken care of. If you ask me, I didn't do the work. <laughs> um, and it was absolutely amazing. It was only the start. Throughout the summer, we were involved with quite a few events. And one of them was to help commemorate the Man Gulch tragedy that 12 smoke jumpers and a firefighter passed away in near Helena. And it was very moving. It happened to be the 70th anniversary of that. And another one was toward the end of, in September, we were able to go to Florida and the Bahamas to do what the plane was built for and help out the folks, the folks that were very, in, had a tough time due to Hurricane Dorian. We were flying 20,000 meals a day and it was hot barbecue stuff. I've never been in a plane that smelled so good. <laughs> Thank you so much. And honestly, the Miss Montana project could not have happened without the support of so many people. It was absolutely incredible. Thank you. I don't know. Thank you, John. We have one more storyteller. Before I introduce her, let me remind you about the next Tell Us Something event on March 25th. The theme is Lost and Found. We are taking story pitches for that right now. Go to tellussomething.org and click Tell a Story to learn how to pitch your story. All right, let's bring this home. Are you ready? <laughs> Molly Bradford is the CEO and co-founder at Gatherboard, the makers of MissoulaEvents.net. <laughs> Molly takes community connection seriously as an active member of the Missoula startup ecosystem in addition to her children's scholastic and community endeavors. Molly is an avid, yet amateur gardener, cook, skier, and hunter who likes to put up mass quantities of food for the winter. 
She's a good friend to have. <laughs> she likes to race her husband and kids down the slopes and makes telecommuting from Mexico a priority. Please welcome Molly Bradford. Six years ago, I shot a doe on opening day. Just a moment before that, I was leaning into the wet sandy bank with detailed certainty that a large herd was gonna exit the forest and come into the field at about sunset. I knew that there were at least three or four monster bucks in the herd. I looked up and the sun was about 15 minutes from setting over the Bitterroot Mountains, which meant there were only 45 minutes of hunting hours left, and my pocket vibrated. It was a text from my husband, Spencer. William has been crying off and on for a couple hours, and he won't take a bottle. How's the hunt going? <laughs> the hunt was going great until then. Although my breast pump lay a couple hundred yards away in the truck and I was engorged under my camo, I thought to myself, am I gonna call off this hunt for the second time today? You see, much earlier that morning, I had woken up before my alarm in a state of shock, wondering why there was an amplified baby seal barking in the next room. But it was not a seal, it was my baby, my son. He was actually struggling to breathe and coughing with what would be his first of nearly 20 bouts of croup. I rushed to William's crib and picked him up, and luckily I was able to pretty quickly stabilize his breathing. And then the dread set in. Today was my day to go hunting. It's opening day. I needed a day off, and this hunt was a gift. A friend of mine with a farm south of Hamilton had offered me an opening day mother's hunt. It was like a sure thing, going to, the, going to go hunting for, for venison at the grocery store almost. And I thought to myself, do I go on the hunt? Do I cancel? Is it fair to, to deprive myself of a day off? Is it fair to leave my sick child with my husband and daughter? Do I cancel on Taylor? Taylor and Meredith had taught me to hunt a few years before that. I primarily hunted with other women and mothers. We had a long-standing relationship with our produce, growing fruits and vegetables, trading them, putting them up for the winter. It was a large group of women who wanted a similar relationship with their meat that they had with their produce. So Spencer and I decided if William was doing better during the day, and the hunt could be postponed until the afternoon, that was a good alternative. And so, here I was, leaned in on the sandy bank, and I knew that the hunt was on. Just a little while before I'd found my position, I had walked over a well-trodden game trail with fresh hoof prints in the sand and droppings and tons of sign of deer. The hair was standing up on the back of my neck I was paying attention to the forest, and I knew I was in the right place. You see, I take the decision to bring life into the world and the decision to take life from the world pretty seriously. I had done a lot to prepare for this hunt. Sighted in my gun nearly perfectly at 100 yards, sourced local non-lead ammo. I had on camo, hunter orange, a backpack, a finely sharpened, field dressing kit, proper nutrition. And as I sat there thinking about all of this, I realized that the forest was quiet. The squirrels were no longer chattering in the background, giving up my position in the forest. I could hear the wings of the raven overhead before I even saw it, reminding me of the sound of breath while giving birth. And then, the deer appeared like they sometimes do. A young spike buck ran out into the field, a scout, a couple fawns and does. After that, a larger buck and lar larger does. I knew that this was not one of the trophies, but this hunt was not about antlers, it was about meat. So I, sight 
I leaned into my gun and put the scope on one of the does, just behind her front leg where I knew the heart would be. And I calmed myself down so that it wasn't shaking before I took my shot. Those deep breaths before the final push that brings life into the world and the pull that takes it. I shot that doe on opening day and it was a great shot on all accounts. I would find out later that I had shot it through the heart. It jumped back a few yards and fell down at the edge of the forest. The rest of the herd scattered. I took my time calming down for a moment in that sandy bank. Then I texted Spencer and Taylor and the landowner to let them know what was going on. And I approached the animal. She had died almost immediately. I slipped some grass into her mouth and put my hand on her neck to thank her for her sacrifice for my family and got to work. Laying out my plastic bag for the heart to take home to EB, my field dressing kit, no headlamp. It was supposed to be a morning hunt and I'd forgotten my headlamp. And in my sleep deprived state, no gloves. I had tons of baby wipes, but no gloves. So I grabbed my knife with my bare hands and started the incision down the breastbone and through the abdomen of the deer when I came to a swollen set of teats. And I had to keep going. I sliced through and the milk spilled into the incision on my hands and my own milk spilled out of my breasts and into my camo. Taylor came up and she quickly talked me down off of what was about to be a bad adrenaline trip. She, stu she steadied the dough and she steadied me. She told me I had to get to work. It was getting dark quickly, we had no light, and we were getting cold. I hastily and sloppily finished field dressing the dough. I put the heart in a bag to bring home while Taylor found a stick to spread the ribs apart to help it cool off more quickly, I cleaned up my hands and packed my bag. We drug the animal, tired, in the dark with no light, stumbling around in the field back to the truck, convincing ourselves that another doe would nurse that fawn tonight and threw it in the back of the truck, saying goodbye and thanks to the farmer on our way out. I dropped Taylor at her mom's about halfway home where we ran into some other friends who'd been fishing that day. We swapped stories of success. There were high fives and cheers, but I was pretty sad. They all tried to convince me again that the fawn would be okay. I got home to a relatively quiet house. William was eager to nurse, and we drifted off into fitful sleep. The next morning, E.B. bounded outside in her pajamas and jumped right up into the back of the truck with the dough. She was so excited to check it out. Did you bring me the heart, Mama? I did. We cut the back strap out of the back of the dough to have later for dinner and went inside where she played with it in the sink, squeezing water in and out of the different valves and putting her finger through the bullet hole. That afternoon, I took the dough and William to the butcher. Some years I have the bandwidth to do my own butchering, but this was not one of those years. The butcher was so excited to see me. In fact, he was about to do an interview with the local news station about the success of his female hunters on opening day. As he told me, his words, not mine, they hunt with more finesse and less ego. He asked how my hunt had gone. I told, as I started to tell him, his lead processor came out from the back, hunched over with gnarled hands and blood on his apron and a hollow, wrinkled face. And I told them about the fawn and the doe and William and the milk and I started to tear up. And the hunchback leaned over and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, it's okay mama, you've done nothing wrong. You've harvested a fine animal for your family. That fawn needed to wean so it could survive the winter. And with that, my suffering lifted. I loaded the baby into the truck and headed home. That evening, as I sat in our 100-year-old kitchen, nursing William, watching my husband cook fresh backstrap for dinner, and my daughter eager to help prepare the heart for fritters, I was soothed by the rhythm of the push and the pull. Thank you.